Tonight's presentation is part of the, our Global Leadership Series, and since we launched this series last year, we've hosted 20 presentations or so, and 15 in cities around the globe. A recent survey asked alumni to help us to shape the program, and the participation of alumni and the broader community uh, has grown steadily over the last year. This and other lectures uh, in the series are podcast, and you can access those, and, and your colleagues and friends can access those from the university website at any time. The agenda for this evening will begin with some opening remarks by the President of the University, Professor Debbie Terry, who will then introduce our speaker, Professor Matt Cooper. There will be an opportunity at the end uh, to ask questions of both Professor Terry and Professor Cooper, and we will then break for some socialising over light refreshments. And I hope that before you go home tonight, you'll get three things out of this evening. You, you'll enjoy the opportunity to update yourself about the university and to meet the President and Vice-Chancellor and other senior colleagues with us tonight. And you'll take home some new understandings from the address from uh, Professor Cooper on the Asian century entrepreneurs and science. And lastly, you'll enjoy some socialising and getting to know other fellow members of the university community here in Indonesia. Let, so let me introduce some of the uh, UQ colleagues here tonight, and I'll ask you to put up your hand and, and show yourselves wherever you are. So Professor Slatko uh, Skirbis, Dean of the Graduate School. Where are you, Slatko? Um, Professor Alistair McEwen, Deputy Executive Dean of Science. Uh, Professor Paul Struper, I don't know whether he's arrived yet. He was, had a long journey today, Head of the School of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering, and he may be with us a little later. Um, Associate Professor Alexander Rakic and Brendan Lutwich, both in, in international development for, the, uh, for engineering architecture and IT. No, they're not here. <laughs> and uh, Professor Ian Godwin uh, in plant molecular genetics in the School of Agriculture and Food Science. We also have Diana Klein and Angela Dean with the Coral Watch Program uh, and the Queensland Brain Institute. And if you wonder why a Coral Watch Program is embedded in the Queensland Brain Institute, I'd say that's a good conversation starter. Uh, and Amanda Briggs... Um, Amanda, uh, our Alumni Engagement Manager, uh, who's put on this evening, and thanks, thanks Amanda, for all your efforts. And then we also have with us uh, Darren Wise, Regional Manager uh, for Indonesia and India, and Patria Asante, Marketing Manager for Indonesia and the Philippines. Now, can I ask you all that we give a warm welcome to the University President and Vice-Chancellor, Professor Debbie Terry. Thank you very much, Claire. And uh, can I acknowledge my UQ colleagues? You've just been introduced to them all. And most importantly, our Indonesian alumni and partners and friends. We're delighted to see so many of you here tonight. We know it's a kind of difficult time to perhaps get through some of the traffic in Jakarta, so we appreciate uh, the fact that you've made uh, the effort. I'm really pleased to be back in Indonesia. This is uh, my fourth visit to Indonesia and, and the third uh, UQ senior uh, delegation. It's often said that an outstanding university is defined by an outstanding alumni. And when I get to mix with our Indonesian alumni, I'm reminded that that statement is almost certainly true. Alumni are core to UQ's heritage and traditions and when we celebrated our centenary uh, here a couple of years ago we focused on, on the past but at the same time you're very much helping us to build our future and we're now in the age of the global university so our alumni all around the world but particularly in Indonesia are particularly important. We've had Indonesian students at UQ for more than 60 years and, they, and you and, and your colleagues have helped contribute to our stature as uh, one of the world's top 100 universities. 
This, year, this year's senior executive mission has got off to a very good start, and we're really here for two reasons. One is to maximise and strengthen our existing ties uh, that we have in, with a number of institutions in UQ and uh, in Indonesia, and obviously with you, our alumni. And another is to affirm some new relationships, ones that will help shape our future successes. Just to give you some insights into what we've been doing so far, yesterday I signed an agreement with uh, Lippi's chair, Professor Luk Lukman Hakim, to enhance cooperation between Lippi and UQ in a range of different areas. Last night, the Australian Embassy uh, generously hosted a UQ reception where we honoured our UQ Indonesian alumni awardees and we encourage all of you here tonight to apply for our new uh, UQ Indonesian Partnership Awards. Uh, today we held a joint seminar with the Eichmann Institute and that went very well. And tomorrow we're going to reun reunite with some of our old friends at UWI and particularly use the opportunity to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the uh, international program in information technology. And we'll also, we will also discuss how our joint programs in psychology and engineering are progressing. Tomorrow afternoon, I'm also looking forward to launching an Indonesian coral reefs and climate change education program. Uh, so that'll be launched at the Australian Embassy. And we've got a range of other visits that are taking place. My colleagues have, are going to be very busy for the rest of the week uh, visiting a range of other places. So you can hear from our program that our engagement in Indonesia is across a wide range of disciplines. And I think this reflects both UQ strengths but also the strengths of our Indonesian alumni. We're very optimistic that our uh, collaborations uh, and uh, uh, links are going to grow into the future. Some of you will have heard that the Australian government has uh, uh, brought in more favourable tr uh, travel warnings for Australians visiting Indonesia, and I think that's very positive for our, for our ongoing engagement. From the Indonesian government, we are increasingly hearing that your government it recognises the importance of international partnerships because they know and we know that these will be critical to achieving sustainable economic, health and environmental goals. So we look forward to uh, in strengthening our international links, Australian links, Australian links into Indonesian, but particularly uh, UQ links. Claire's spoken uh, briefly about uh, how, how engaged our Indonesian alumni are and I know that she's keen for some of you to help form a, a, a volunteer group so that we can understand the kinds of services and things that you're interested in receiving from UQ once you return to Indonesia. Through the recent survey that we did conduct with our alumni right across the world, alumni were very clear that they liked these kinds of seminars and networking events and in Indonesia life sciences and business rated among the top six themes where the alumni uh, were interested in hearing uh, seminars. So I think tonight's global leadership seminar entitled The Asian Century Entrepreneurs and Science ticks both those key boxes, life sciences and business. And many of our academics at UQ are in very high demand as presenters because they're outstanding researchers and excellent communicators. But in the context of our partnership with Indonesia, I don't think we could go past tonight's speaker, Professor Matt Cooper. Soon after Matt graduated with an honours degree in science from the University of Adelaide, he spent many months travelling in Indonesia. He fell in love with your country and above all with the Indonesian people. He lived in small villages and big cities and he grew determined that his life's work must benefit Indonesians. He later went on to spend 13 years in, in the UK researching and gaining a very strong reputation as a biotechnology entrepreneur. Then in 2009 he returned to Australia and joined UQ's Institute for Molecular Bioscience. Today He's working on a range of different areas that we're going to hear about tonight, but how, how we can better diagnose dengue fever, how we uh, can establish and identify new drugs for TB, 
and find new ways to stop people dying from infections and cancer. He's going to tell you all much more about his work, so please do enjoy tonight's talk. Make sure you spend time uh, talking to each other, talking to myself and my colleagues, and we look forward to working with you in the future to further strengthen the links that UQ has with our alumni in Indonesia and indeed with our partners in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Terry. Bagaimana kita malam ini? Assalamualaikum, selamat malam. Saya selalu baik, kapar selalu baik, tetapi malam ini sangat senang. Tetapi saya sudah lupa terlalu banyak kata, saya harus minta maaf di atas anda. 22 tahun yang lalu, saya anak kecil datang di sini. Saya suka sekali orang ramah-ramah di Indonesia. Seperti untuk saya, keluarga. Anda, mereka, di orang Indonesia ramah-ramah sekali, baik hati. Tetapi saya harus minta maaf, tak ada ganding yang tak ada letaknya. Hah? Betul? Begitulah saya, otak saya, letaknya saya, otak saya suri karet, saya sudah lupa. Saya harus minta maaf di atas anda, boleh pakai bahasa Inggris? Boleh? Bagus sekali, terima kasih. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, Professor Terry, once again, to represent the university. And switching to English, tonight we're going to learn about Indonesia and Australia. So this is a question for the audience, and UQ can answer, or Indonesia can answer, I don't mind. So what does Indonesia and Australia have in common? Don't be shy, jangan malu-malu. What do we have in common? Anyone? Both new countries. Here we are. Both new countries. It's very good, and I'll take that one. So UQ one, Indonesia zero. We have to make that better. Later. <laughs> so we are. We're both new countries, but we're also both very old countries. And if you go back to Indonesia, the origins of animism and Buddhism and Islam, Hinduism, the Majapahit Kingdom, the tradition and the culture of Indonesia is incredibly strong. The Majapahit Kingdom in the 14th century and all the way through to India and Pakistan. And the tradition in, in Indonesia is maintained in the Gamalan, the Ramayana, the Putra. It's very, very strong. But you're right. It's also a very new country. Only 60, 70 years old. Merdeka, and after the occupation by the Japanese, Sukarno, one of the great visionaries in Indonesia, and still one of the great men that revered in the country, took the country from an occupied state, then under the Dutch, and made a new country. So it really is a new country. And look how it happens now, Jakarta. In that short space of time, three generations, what's happened? Indonesia has exploded. The versatility, the work of the people, the incredible opportunities, the natural diversity, the resources. Jakarta and other cities in Indonesia have gone from strength to strength in that short space of time. It's really amazing. You should be all amazed how much has been done in Indonesia since the days of Sukarno to today. Like Indonesia, we are also a very old country in Australia. Our traditions go back to the early Aboriginals and the indigenous population 50,000 years ago. In fact, the oldest art recorded where man has taken cerebral ideas and spirituality and put them to something we can see today exists in northern Australia in places like Kakadu. This is the lightning man of the Gagaju people. And some of this art goes back 40,000, 50,000 years, long before the caves in France. So Australia is also a very old country with lots of tradition. Like Indonesia, in the last 200, 250 years, there's been dramatic change from the occupation uh, and the real exploitation of the indigenous people by, by white settlers. Australia has changed beyond recognition. And just like the story with Jakarta, what we're doing now in Australia is changing the flora and the fauna and the quality of life of the people. So there are many things. We share a sea, but really we're both old and young countries. And in that way, because we're neighbours, Saudara, we have opportunities to learn from each other. The other key thing, the big change that's happened, is when I first came to Indonesia, I hitchhiked on a yacht and it took me four days to get from Darwin to Kubang. But now you can jump on a plane. So this is just showing you all of the different flight paths that exist in the world now. And it's possible to have a meeting in New York and be in Indonesia on the same day. I can have one meeting in Germany and be back in Singapore on the same day. You can be anywhere in the world in 24 hours now. And that's only happened since the 1970s. 
So more so than ever before, we're not just common neighbors and brothers and sisters, but we're all connected. We can see each other very quickly. And things are changing still beyond that. This is actually a, a real-time snapshot of planes in the air. So every one of these little yellow dots represents a plane. And as you can see here, this is morning in the US, midday in Europe, and nighttime in China. And you can see there's a healthy carbon footprint in the US and Europe, as you'd expect. But as it becomes morning in Southeast Asia, look at China now. Look at Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, the eastern seaboard of Australia. And so this really is the Asian center, the Asian century. Things are starting to happen in this region here. We all hear about the BRICS and the age of the new um, Asians. And Australia is really aware of this. We need to look more closely to our neighbors and understand and help each other. Of course, with these changes, both for Indonesia and for Australia, there becomes challenges. And I'm, I've heard many stories of people getting here tonight and taking probably twice as long in a car that we've taken to Jalankaki, yeah? but, but there are challenges. As we become more and more populous as nations, there are issues with transport, with overcrowding, with food security, with water security. And these are issues that face not just Indonesians, but also face Australians as well. At UQ, we have many, many programs that deal with these issues. We're looking at global sea temperature changes, global rises in, in sea levels. We're looking at how they impact the reef, how they impact food security. We're also looking in terms of food security, not just in the analogy of bees in a hive and how in a very, very crowded space we can all find some pollen and some honey to eat, but with that becomes impacts on social cohesion, upon the dynamics between societies and individuals. And also in disease, as you know with, with bees, if you have too many beehives in a monoculture, it's an opportunity for disease. Nature loves diversity. Ecosystems thrive on diversity. And when we get too many people in short spaces of time, as we've seen with influenza and other epidemics, it can lead to disease. So at the University of Queensland, we're tackling the big issues. And there are many of those. There's no shortage of work. There's no danger of being unemployed in R&D in the next 20 years, that's for sure. So we're very, very focused on climate change and adaption. We have a new um, Institute for Global Climate Change, which has been um, built and now operational at UQ. We're interested in sustainable cities and how we can protect marine and coastal processes and management, which is key to the food chain and to diversity. Conservation and natural resource management is just as much an issue in Australia as it is in Indonesia. And also in terms of disease, where I work in, in my um, laboratories, understanding how disease evolves and changes and progresses Understanding how we can better diagnose disease. We can't treat someone unless we diagnose them. And diagnostics is still in the dark ages. Louis Pasteur would probably recognize many of the techniques in microbiology, for instance. And ultimately, how we can use vaccines and therapeutics to prevent disease or cure diseases. So at the University of Queensland, as many of you here know, having um, studied there, it is truly a multidisciplinary uh, university. We have centers of excellence and a track record of international excellence in chemistry, biology, physical sciences, engineering, social sciences, geography, arts and humanity. And in fact, in Australia, we were ranked as being A star or the top of the, of the top in more categories than any other university in Australia. It also is very multicultural. I think it's a fantastic thing. It's one of the reasons I wanted to come back to Australia is because I value multiculturalism. In my group, I probably have 22 different nationalities represented. There are more people from other countries than there are from Australia in the research group. And we are internationally recognized uh, in the Times Higher Education Supplement, in the Shanghai Institute. We're now becoming not just one of the best universities, if not the best in Australia, but one of the best universities in the world. So we then look at some of those challenges on the previous slide. I want to focus just for a little while on disease. And in particular, just two diseases, because we haven't got much time. And a new disease, dengue fever, which has been driven by population growth. You'll see that in the next few slides. And superbugs, or antibiotic-resistant bacteria, which is driven by the way we use um, finite resources. So this graph here shows you a number of the mega cities or super cities in Asia. And we have 1950, 1980, and 2010. And what you can see here, if we just take Jakarta, is in 1950, um, you know, before Merdeka, then there was probably one and a half million people in, in Jakarta. It's hard to imagine now, one and a half million people in this city. 2010, we're now up, depending on what, where you draw the line for Greater Jakarta, between 16 and 18 million people. And that is not a long period of time. 
We're changing too fast. It's no wonder we have problems with transport, with infrastructure, with water. Things are happening too fast and the capacity for individuals to adjust to that change is limited by the rate of change of population growth. But diseases don't care. As I said, nature has a cunning way of making balance happen in life. And for diseases, when you get conglomerations of people in spaces, in particular for dengue fever, dengue is spread by a mosquito called Aedes aegypti, and it loves cities. It doesn't like to be out in jungles or in rivers. It likes to be in urban areas, and it can bite people during the daytime when they're going to work or, or working in an office. So we go back to the beginning in 1950, dengue fever really didn't exist. It was a small disease, little studied, little known, that existed in Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, and parts of the Philippines. But it, it killed you know, a couple of hundred, maybe a thousand people a year, and it, it wasn't a really big uh, threat. If we now look what happened in that period of time, into the 70s, particularly with the advent of the Boeing 747 and, and you know, low cost flights, we can now see the disease has spread all through the Indonesian archipelago. In the 80s, we had epidemics starting to appear, localised in Queensland, spread through Myanmar, into Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, and beyond. And if I showed you the global map, basically it's already into the Middle East and into uh, South America. So in that very short space of time, we've gone from not having this disease to it, it basically doubling in incidence every decade. If we look at global distribution, we go back um, again uh, to the 50s or so, or 1970s, uh, dengue comes in four flavours, four serotypes. And the reason this is important, if you get bitten one time and get dengue one, you'll get a bit sick. But if you get dengue two the next time, that can be very bad news. That can lead to hemorrhagic fever and death. So again, with the advent of travel, when people can jump on a plane and spread disease, we can now see very rapidly the different serotypes crossing into Africa, into South America, into Asia, to the extent that now in 2011, basically all of these four flavours of dengue are everywhere. So the risk of dying from dengue has gone up enormously because of the way we're now all connected by aeroplanes. So here UQ is fighting back. Um, we have one of the world's most eminent virologists, Paul Young, who's been working on dengue fever for more than 20 years, and others at the School of Molecular Science and the AIBN. And together we're combining our knowledge and our approach to find better ways to diagnose dengue. So with the Red Cross, the blood service, we've got a, a linkage grant to actually find ways to screen blood for dengue. At the moment, blood is screened for HIV, it's screened for hep hepatitis B and C, but people are catching dengue through the blood service. We don't want that. So we're developing a blood test for dengue. We're studying the structure of the proteins that are involved in how the virus enters into cells, how it causes people to get sick. And from that, we're starting to work out which parts of that particular protein we can use to attack with novel drugs for dengue. And then together with local industry, we're developing new diagnostics. Um, these are very, very low cost, very, very simple, five minutes time to result. And they're very similar in terms of the results to some of the pregnancy tests and other low cost tests you get. So we're working on screening, novel drugs, and novel diagnostics. In terms of the other thread I talked about, bacteria, it's more complicated. We now know, and we're doing lots of research on some of the protective bacteria in the gut. As society changes and we go from a high fiber, low protein, low fat diet through to a low fiber, high protein, high fat diet, that changes the gut biota, the bacteria that live in your stomach and your intestines. In fact, there are more bacteria in you than there are cells in you. So there's more bacteria than there are cells in your body. You're kind of, you know if you're a passenger or a driver, but we now know that many of these bacteria are helpful. They protect from cancer and they protect from inflammation and disease. But of course, there's also these superbugs. And so this nasty one here, Helobacter pylori, actually causes gastric cancer. It's responsible for 6% of all human cancers, just that one bug. So what is a superbug? And um, when I go to give these types of talks, I, I go to the wisdom in the house, which is my children. So my youngest son, who's uh, seven, says, well, that's easy. This is a superbug. And he drew me a picture, not unlike this one. It has a big S on it, and it can fly faster than any other bug. And my oldest son, who's 10, he knows what a superbug is. This is James Bond, and he uses lots of bugs, and he leaves them around, and this is clearly what it is. And you know, if you go further on and ask my wife, she'll talk about the millennium bug, which was probably the, the most overblown bug that never came. But of course, what I'm going to talk about now is the bacteria. So in this context, a superbug 
is a bacteria that is resistant to antibiotics. It means that we no longer have a drug we can give you if you're sick to make you better. The bug will just laugh at the antibiotic and keep on growing and eventually you could die. And the reason I'm worried about this is that when we look at the origins of bacteria, soon after the earth cooled and water condensed upon the planet, bacteria started colonizing the world 3.8 billion years ago. In terms of us as a species, if we look at the science and the fossil records, roughly 4.8 million years was when Homo sapiens first appeared and differentiated as a species on the planet. So that's 0.001% of the time that the bacteria have been around. So the bacteria have had lots of time to evolve and um, divide. Whereas using antibiotics against bacteria, we've only been doing that for 80 years. So we're using up, most of the antibiotics we have actually come from bacteria. They're used in chemical warfare to attack each other. And we're using up 3.8 billion years worth of novel drugs and antibiotics in a very short space of time. Well, what was life like before antibiotics? And, and most of the people in this audience are all under the age of 35, of course, so we, we won't know. But if you go back not so long ago, roughly one in three people died from infection. A lot of people died when they were very young, before five years old, from pneumonia or for a simple cut or an infection. So when you had a cut back in the 20s or the 10s or early 30s, it was a really serious issue. If you didn't get treated properly, you could die. Unfortunately, now in many um, resource poor settings, a lot of these diseases still do kill a lot of people. Dysentery, sepsis, cholera, tuberculosis, kill tens of millions, even, even more every year. The origin of antibiotics comes um, pre-war, initially from Germany, in compounds called sulfonamides, and they were yellow. They, looked, they were called sulfur drugs. And they were developed by a company called Bayer, who's now quite famous in the 1930s. They were very good against streptococci, and these sulfur drugs were used in World War II. So when a soldier had a wound, they'd just dust them onto the wound and stop the infection. In the UK, penicillin was isolated by Howard Florey, Dick Chain, and um, Alexander Fleming. And it was really a race here because the Germans had their sulfur drugs and the Allies had their penicillin. So it's a great story. They, they first showed that the very initial penicillin G worked in a, an animal study. Uh, and six weeks later, the first dose was given to man. These days it takes you about seven years of paperwork to do that same transition between the two. But penicillin made a huge difference to life quality. One of the Nobel Prize winners, Alexander Fleming, is a very smart man, obviously, and he already saw the issue. This is a quote from the New York Times on the day of his award of the Nobel Prize. The greatest possibility of evil is to use too small a dose. And by doing that, you could educate or allow the bacteria to become resistant. If you don't wipe out all of the bacteria, you'll allow some of those to come forward and become superbugs. And this is exactly what happened. And if you go back to the 1930s, what this graph shows you is on the left-hand side, the first time that, that antibiotic was used in man. And on the right-hand side was the first time that a superbug was found for that particular antibiotic. So you can see for sulfonamides, it was about 10 years. For penicillin, it was about eight years. As we go through these antibiotics, it's quite scary. A lot of them only took five years or 10 years to find resistance. There are two exceptions. One is erythromycin, and the second one is vancomycin. Both are natural products isolated from biodiversity. So very important to keep that. What you can see now, though, is that there's very little happening here. In the 1970s, pharmaceutical companies turned into lifestyle drugs, into Lipitor, into Viagra, obesity, chronic diseases, which made a lot of money. Lipitor makes $13 billion every year for Pfizer. So everyone walked away from antibiotics. So at the University of Queensland, we're using all of our technology, genomics, microbiology, biochemistry, and chemistry to fight back. So we've taken an old antibiotic. This is something called vancomycin, which was actually discovered in Kalamantan in, um, in Borneo in 1953 by a missionary who took a soil sample uh, and brought it back to uh, Eli Lilly in the US. And we've made a new antibiotic now, which just doesn't stop the bacteria growing. It actually blows them up. So this is a, a super antibiotic that can really kill the antibiotic stone dead. By doing that, we make sure there's no resistant bacteria left to, to divide. And if you look at the activity, this is basically a measure of how active the compound is, the drug is. This is penicillin here against resistant bacteria. It's not working. This is vancomycin. This is a competitor compound. And here's our compound, eucumycin. And this is a log scale. Scientists like to use log scales because otherwise we'd be up on the 18th floor. 
but here you can see we are one, two, three, you know, two and a half, three logs, 500 times more active than the original compound using that technology. We're doing the same thing for tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, I know, is a big issue in, in uh, Sulawesi, in um, Adi Jaya, other parts of Indonesia. And it kills about 5,000 people every day. There are 26,000 new cases of tuberculosis every day around the world. So this is a big disease and a real problem. And the reason it's very hard to kill is it goes into different parts of the body, it goes into places where it's protected, and it's very hard to get drugs to attack that compound. And so this is just chemical structures, but we've now developed at UQ new drugs against TB that kill the drug-resistant superbug TB as well as the normal TB. So in this, you can see that we're doing a lot of basic science, and we're trying to address issues that involve climate change, population, disease. But one of the key things UQ is very good at is entrepreneurship. Many of you heard of Gardasil, which came from the laboratories of Ian Fraser. And that really is the first vaccine for cancer. Spectacular achievement. There hasn't been a vaccine for cancer before or since. But now that's probably taken by in the order of two, three hundred million people to protect them against uh, infection from HPV. So UQ has got a very good track record of translating science into products on the market. And that requires entrepreneurship. So many people ask me, what is an entrepreneur and what makes an entrepreneur? And I've been lucky enough uh, in the UK to be involved with a number of companies developing instrumentation, different type of protein and DNA chips and microfluidics, uh, DNA sequencing technology, which is really changing the way we're going to actually look at disease. You'll be able to sequence your own genome for about $1,000 within five years. Um, I'm serious. It's really going to change the way we look at ourselves and diagnose disease. And then before I came to UQ, two companies using high frequency acoustics and then a handheld diagnostic as well. So I've had some experience of, of companies. And to do that, I had to raise a lot of money. <laughs> I probably raised more than $50 million. And I've visited every single one of these venture capital firms around the world. But it's not about the money. Um, what makes an entrepreneur is not that story. It's how you got there. So it's not about a Ferrari. That doesn't drive an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur really doesn't want to make money at the beginning. It's kind of a side effect. This is how I get to work um, to UQ. So what makes an entrepreneur? The first thing to remember when you go home tonight, and maybe driving home or walking home, is motivasi, motivation. Kemampuan adalah sesuatu atau hal yang apa yang dapat anda lakukan. Kemampuan menentukan apa yang dapat anda lakukan. So this is a famous uh, U.S. football coach, one of the most, the Green Bay Packers, one of the most successful football coaches in American history. Ability is what you're capable of doing. Motivation determines what you do. And attitude defines how you do it. This is probably my favorite in this series of quotes, and it comes from Woodruff T. Wilson, um, American president. And it's about persistence. Nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Talent is overrated. Genius will not, and education will not. I shouldn't say that too loudly tonight. But persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has always solved our problems. If you really want to be an entrepreneur, you have to be persistent. Put in the 5,000 hours or whatever it takes to, to get there. The next one, of course, is confidence. There's no point planning for failure. There's no point thinking, I might be able to do this. So, malakukan atau tidak malakukan. Tidak ada kata mencoba. This is from this famous um, orator and, and sage, Yoda, from Star Wars and the Jedi Knights. There is do or not do. Don't try. We don't want to try. You either do it or you don't do it. Just uh, decide. And of course, part of this is mentors. I've been fortunate enough to have three very, very good mentors in my career. And it's Isaac Newton, one of the true polymaths in, in science and one of the greatest scientists we've known. Um, if I've been seen further, it's by standing on the shoulder of giants. So find some, don't be shy, find some mentors. Talk to someone who's done it before. Listen to them, ask them questions. Use them as a, a source of information. Next most important thing, team, team kerja. Bila sendirian, kita akan jatuh ada hancur. Bersama-sama kita adalah laut. Or as you say here, more bersatu kita tenggu, bercari kita runtu. And this is a beautiful quote from uh, Ryosuke Sotoro from Japan. Individually, we are a drop. Together, we are an ocean. 
and no, no entrepreneur has done something alone. Kerja karas. It's bad news, but it's true. All the entrepreneurs put the hours in. And this is Thomas Edison. Genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. So the Americans have really got it with Woodruff, Wilson, and persistence, and Edison with uh, hard work. Hasil. Bukanlah siapa saya, tapi ada yang dapat saya lakukan itulah yang menentukan siapa saya. And this is again one of those virtual quotes, but I like it. It's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me. Talk is cheap. Action means things. People remember action. And then towards the end, ideas. And when I was younger, I thought it was all about ideas. I thought, I just had to have the right idea. If I have the right idea, I'll be successful. That idea will get all the way to the market. And it's true, you do need a good idea, but it's just the beginning. Paul Dirac, Nobel Prize winner for physics, the best way to have a good idea is have lots of ideas. So finally, um, I, I found in my own career, it was also important to travel. And in terms of what I'm working on now, dengue, superbugs, TB, the reason I've chosen to do that is because of all these people I've met around the world. And they have so much wisdom, they're so kind, they're so graceful, spiritual. We, we really can learn a lot from each other by visiting people in different places of the world. So I'd like to encourage you all to talk to us. Um, we are here. I, I mean it. I think the Orang Ramatam in Indonesia, by Hati Sagalo. I think that the wisdom behind, you know, this democracy guided by inner wisdom, part of Pancasila. So there are opportunities for UQ with our campuses in Indonesia to do things bersama-sama together. Terima kasih banyak. My, my name is Asep Saifuddin from Bogor Agricultural University. Uh, my question is related to the knowledge-based uh, business that you create in UQ. But I'm not sure uh, that, uh, if you have that kind of business develop from research you find and then you say develop uh, something like a, a company and which is that company is knowledge based company my question is is it uh, very easy in your country to, to get some money from that uh, findings because here in Indonesia uh, knowledge based business is not very easy, it's very hard to, mm. to, 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 to market the, the research findings. So what is your experience in you sure. so, so to answer your questions, um, companies need to make money. And to do that, the investor have enough, has to have enough confidence that it will be a product that is sold or another company will value the assets of that company sufficient to buy it. They don't just invest in the R&D. They do invest in the team um, to a stage where if you have someone on board you can find who's done one or two companies, then it's much easier to find money because they know that that person has learned by doing. You know, there's no book on, well, there are books, but they, every business is different. So you do need to think about product. Um, if it's just knowledge-based, back in the 90s there were lots of companies that exploited the genome or informatics to try and add value, but now Take the R&D you have and think, okay, who would buy this? Why would they buy this? And then think about route to market, something to really think about importantly. If you have this novel idea, novel technology, you need to get it to the market. It may be too expensive to get to the market by yourself. You may want to partner early. You may want to license to a small company or large company. So starting a company is not the only way to, to make money in route to market. So. Think of the consumer as well. Ultimately, there are, there are consumers for everything, for this uh, pointer, for this bottle of water. Someone bought it at some stage. So when you've got an idea in the lab, try and think, who would be the consumer? Who would use it? So if you can go through that process of thinking um, about a business plan and a route to market, then when you meet an investor, it's very different. If you go to an investor just with an idea and some R&D, they'll sort of say, that's very interesting, but uh, 
what about capital investment, what about P&L, what about R&D, you know, so try and think more about product. I, I think it's really important, especially now, you can say this idea, this R&D will lead to this product. And then you have much more chance of getting uh, investment. Yes, yeah, so the University of Queensland has a long-standing policy, um, which is okay that most universities in the world do the same. So they, they take a, a piece of IP, a, a patent, and they give a third to the inventors, they give a third back to the laboratory where the ideas came from, and a third goes to the university. And so roughly that's how things tend to be split up. So the university will own some of the company, the inventors will own some of the company, investors will own some of the company. And again, early on, don't worry too much about that. It's very, when, when you're first doing a company, you think, oh, I want to own 12% of the company or 7% of the company. Actually, it doesn't matter. Um, if the company is a success, that's much more important than 12% or 7%. I would like to ask about uh, being entrepreneur and uh, researchers. Uh, in your opinion, it should be uh, maybe two functions in one person because uh, my colleague in Georgia maybe have an issue where the, that's only researchers not jumping to entrepreneur because there's uh, more, more business issue there and how to reach about the academy or science world and the uh, business world. Do you have any experience? And then do you encourage or urge researchers to be an entrepreneur or just But UQ actually I think is fantastic. What it does, and even in its undergraduate degree, it has a, a bio business day out. It has opportunities to learn entrepreneurship, to meet people that have done it before. So at the University of Queensland, even in the undergraduate, postgraduate degree, they have elements of a product plan. They, they give you some of the skills and the opportunities to learn what it takes. Personally, obviously, I think it's a lot of fun doing both. And it's about hedging me and stylistic thinking. People think you have to be in industry or you have to be in academia because they're two labels that we have for those people. But in the US, they don't care. People go into industry, go back to academia, start a company, go and teach again. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. So. I think the, the main challenge then is to ask yourself with your research, in terms of your effort and time you spend every day, do you think that you want to take it somewhere? Um, so it really is up to you. I mean, in terms of what you can do, it, you can go and raise some money. You can form a small company in the university environment. You can talk to a larger company and get them encouraged. At UQ, it is definitely encouraged. You're encouraged to file patents. You're encouraged to raise money. Um, and at the undergraduate level, you're enabled to, to learn about those processes. So don't let those boundaries, those names, academia, industry, stop you. You decide what you want to do uh, and then do it. <laughs>